Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation, exploring the life-changing potential of solo travel, intentional travel, and location-independent working. Whether you're an aspiring digital nomad or simply wish to boost your confidence through epic travel experiences, I'm here to motivate and inspire you to go after all your wildest dreams. I'm Jessica Grace Coleman, author, certified travel coach, founder of the Travel Transformation Company, and your host for the Travel Transformation Podcast. Travel changed my life. Now let's change yours. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation. My name is Jessica Grace Coleman. I'm your host. And today I'm talking to Melissa B. Lombardo, author, speaker, and founder of Right Heal Thrive, LLC. Melissa is a well-traveled Connecticut native who lived in Central America for two decades. She is a bilingual certified sexual assault crisis advocate and knows firsthand the silence surrounding the topic of sexual violence. It was through the support of friends and family that she navigated the path of vulnerability to begin speaking out and supporting the healing of those who have faced their own trauma. She now advocates for others as they begin to heal and thrive to become their best version. As a naturally inquisitive person, Melissa credits her love of writing as the reason she was able to find her voice and thrive beyond trauma. Melissa is the founder of Right Heal Thrive, which offers holistic, conscious individuals the opportunity to continue their healing journey, support a supporter, and offer guidance to individuals as they find their path to healing, thriving, and well-being via books and other publications. In this episode, we discuss Melissa's time spent in Nicaragua, the reverse culture shock she had when coming back to the States, how she used writing and publishing to help her heal from trauma, and how she's helping Nicaraguan artists and artisans through her Etsy shops. Plus, so much more. So let's get to the interview. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so let's just dive straight in. (laughs) We're going to talk about all things travel and transformation. But can you, first of all, tell our listeners who you are, where you're from, and what you do? Yes, my name is Melissa Lombardo. I am originally from the United States, but I spent many years living abroad. I am currently an author of a book titled Hurt, Healing, and Hope, Thriving Beyond Sexual Assault. And part of my travel transformation really got to me to the point of healing and thriving and and publishing this book. So I think if it wasn't for the travel, um, maybe I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I've lived abroad in countries that didn't speak the same language as I did. I've lived abroad in countries that did speak the same language as I did, in addition to living in various places in my own country as well. Right. And you're in Connecticut right now. And as I was saying before, I love New England. It's so pretty. Are you from there or are you from a different state? I was born in Connecticut, born and raised. My family history um, comes actually from Ireland and Italy, where my grandparents and my great-grandparents were from, and they settled in the New England area, and that is where I currently am again. So I lived abroad, I traveled abroad, I came back to my home state to continue my next steps in my journey. Nice. Now, you mentioned living abroad there, so I believe you lived in Central America for quite a few years, is that right? Yes, I yeah, so whereabouts was this and how did you first move there? What what made you go there? Well, that's a loaded question. No, I love that question. So ever since I was young, my mother used to instill the value in us of meeting people, knowing them for who they were, accepting people for who they were. It didn't matter what they looked like, where they were from, if they had an accent. So I think from a really early age, I had the idea that I wanted to see everything that was out there in the world. So my travel started by doing a few study abroads. And I was able to live in England and live in Spain for a period of time. And then it wasn't until I was studying my master's degree that I had this opportunity to have an internship in Central America. My goal at the time was I wanted to live and work in another language, country, culture that was not similar to mine at all. And I happened to find this great opportunity for six months in Nicaragua. That six-month opportunity turned into almost 17 years of my life, and they hired me on full-time after the six months. I was working at this great little hotel, and they continued to recontract me, and then I just, you know, life, wherever you are, 
life can just take you away. So, you know, life took me away. I graduated from the university. I found a full-time position in Nicaragua and I met somebody who would later become my husband and I then had a child and everything that comes with life. Wow, that's uh, that's quite the adventure, thinking you're going for six months and then ending up wait, 17 years. Did you say that's that's incredible? Well, first of all, when you went there to start with, did you have any fears or anxieties or is it just like full on excitement for, you know, learning about this new place, this new culture, this new language? I think it was a little bit of both. When I was in college, I, I studied for my undergraduate for college was Spanish and sociology with a political science minor. And it was in my own way, an international studies degree. I was working at the school for, or the Center for Social Research, and I had a boss, Ben Tyson, great, great guy, became my mentor. And when I was graduating from college, he says, where are you going after this? And at that point in time, and this is going to get to Nicaragua, because this is a big influencing factor. And at that point in time, I was thinking of joining the AmeriCorps and going to Texas. And he says to me, well, why are you going to Texas? And I said, well, I have a friend from there. I've been to Texas. I, I know a lot about it. And he goes, well, have you ever th thought of going to New Mexico? And I said, no, I, I don't know anything about New Mexico. I've never been there. And it turns out he was living in New Mexico doing research projects. And he says, well, you know, there's this little town called Cuba, New Mexico. And I was a grad student. And, you know, he told me what he did. He's like, you should go somewhere where you don't know anyone and you'll meet people from there. So that's how I actually got to New Mexico. So when the opportunity years later came to me, to either go to, at the time, it was Costa Rica, or it was Costa Rica, it was Bolivia. Those were the two options I, you know, that were on my radar. And the opportunity in Bolivia was given to somebody else. So then I thought, well, Costa Rica, okay, fine. But then I had Ben Tyson come into my mind, my former mentor and boss, thinking, oh, but why do I want to go to Costa Rica? Oh, I, I know people from there. It's in the news a lot. It seems really pretty. I've studied about it. And then this opportunity in Nicaragua came up. Oh, I don't know anyone in Nicaragua. Don't know anything about it. Okay, how about I go to Nicaragua? So that's actually how I got to Nicaragua. It was kind of blazing that trail or that path, thinking of this former mentor of mine who encouraged me to go out to places where I didn't know anything about or didn't know anybody. So the strange thing about that experience was my boss, the one who had hired me for the hotel that I was going to be at for just six months, she actually um, got me a plane ticket to go through Costa Rica. So I actually did go to Costa Rica. I stayed overnight, got on the bus the next day. And yeah, obviously I was anxious and, and overwhelmed. I had copied these pages out of the Lonely Planet Nicaragua Guide. And I'm reading about Nicaragua on the plane to Costa Rica. Next day, I'm on the bus going into uh, Nicaragua. And I'm sitting next to the first woman I've met from Nicaragua, little woman right there. And her and I are trying to chat. I realized that all my time living in Spain didn't really help a lot with the accent in certain words and dialects, you know, that they use in, in other parts of the world and especially Nicaragua. So I'm sitting with this next to this woman and I look out the window and I see what I now know are oxen. And I looked at, I didn't know what they were at this moment in time. And I asked the woman what they were and she tried to explain to me, she explained to me five, six, I don't know, eight times we're trying to figure out what this is. And it suddenly occurred to me that it must be in the cow family. That's what I, th I thought to myself. So I said to her, I said, is it like a cow? I specifically said, is it like a cow? You know, like a cousin to a cow. And she looks at me. It suddenly occurred to her that this was probably the way to get out of the conversation with this foreign girl who had no idea what she was talking about. And she looks at me and she says, no, it's not like a cow. That is a cow. I said, no, no, it's it's like a cow. And now she's trying to convince me that that is a cow. Oxens are not cows. We know that. You know that. I know that now. But I said, that's really strange. I don't know if that's really a cow. But if, if she says it's a cow, it, it totally must be a cow. It's just like a Nicaraguan cow. I don't know. So I get into Nicaragua, and that was my first experience with a Nicaraguan woman. And I found out later from the receptionist at the hotel that I was going to be managing that that is definitely not a cow. And he says, that woman was probably just tired of explaining to you 
what it was. So she just decided to be agreeable and tell you that was a cow. So that was my first experience actually going into Nicaragua. <laughs> I love that. You were like, it's just an exotic cow. It's like, <laughs> that's what yeah. it was. <laughs> Oh gosh, it, it was it was actually it's really actually telling the story now. I've never told that on air. Telling the story <laughs> like that, it, it it is hilarious. But it was the beginning of everything else. Oh, nice! And I love that you know you sort of chose somewhere completely the opposite way most people choose places. They they usually do choose places where they have you know at least know someone or they know people have been and they have they can have recommendations and you know they have that safety net. And I like that's the whole sort of point of you know, feeling a bit safer about going to a place. But I love that you just went like, no, I want to go somewhere. I don't know where anyone, I'm not even, I don't know anything about it. You know, I don't know what their cows look like. And um, <laughs> let's, just, let's just see what happens. So I love that approach to it. You obviously loved it there because you stayed for so long. Can you tell me what you love about that country? Oh my gosh. So I, I've been coming to believe lately that there are, I was ta- actually, I was just having this conversation last week about something really similar to what you asked, and it's really interesting. So I am going to, li- right now, live on air, be reflecting on this. I think that certain people can kind of get the feeling of where geographically that they're supposed to be. I think that sometimes our conditions, for example, you know, you move to a new house and you're suddenly, you know, maybe allergies have come up or, you know, there's different health things going on. And, and, you know, you just feel like maybe that's not your spot or you go into an, a job or a new environment and you just suddenly feel good about being there. So I think our body tells us so many different things, you know, about what we're supposed to be doing, where we're supposed to be doing it, things like that. When I went to Nicaragua, so after the experience with the cow and after actually a taxi driver charged me $30 to go maybe a mile, which was blatantly not the cost. And that did not affect me though. I think what I noticed when I was in Nicaragua those first six months is that there was something about this place that made me feel like home. And it was perhaps, or, you know, it was perhaps getting to the point where I was being invited to somebody's house and actually being able to go right inside the front door and be sitting on a rocking chair. Now, in these time periods in the area where I lived, that just being invited to go into somebody's physical home and not way outside meant that you were kind of in now, you know, and then being offered something to drink was like that other step. So I went through what I call these small steps to feeling like I was being accepted into those different, you know, houses. And I remember things from when I was growing up. We, I grew up on a small beach town. Uh, my grandparents had a house on the beach and we stayed there in the summers. We went into each other's homes, you know, with the other kids in the neighborhood. And we basically, it was that village raising a child. And when I was in Nicaragua, I had that same thought that, you know, being in each other people's houses, being able to see how the community worked and how people took care of not only their other kids, but they looked out for children of others or they, you know, let somebody borrow this or here, I'm going to give you some beans today because I know tomorrow you're going to bring me a piece of cake, things like that. And, And that's how I grew up. That's what it was like in my big family. And now I'm here in Nicaragua and I I feel that this is my spot. So I think in a sense, it was that geographic, and I don't know, I I think there must be a term for it, but geographically speaking, I feel like my heart found its spot, you know, And, and it was those first six months that, you know, I just couldn't get enough of all these things that, you know, were, were taking place. I didn't even really realize what they were, but I, I knew that this was my spot. So when the, my boss at the time, there are two sisters, Nancy and Terry, wonderful women. We're still in touch today. They said, Melissa, you, would you like to, you know, stay longer? Sure. Of course. Six more months, one more month, one more month. And I thought to myself, if I don't leave now, I'm not going to graduate from school. I'm not going to present my thesis. I didn't come all this way to not have the degree. So I let them know. They said, you know, this is going to really have to be that last month. I I really need to finish my degree. And I already had it in my head that I'm going to come back. It was in that last month that I met he who would later become my husband. I did leave. I presented my thesis and then I went back, you know, to Nicaragua and that going back, you know, wasn't too long after that. And that turned into all those years. And I've had that opportunity to raise my son and nieces and nephews and, you know, 
just live a life that was so fulfilling in ways I never could have even imagined. And then unfortunately I, I got very sick and I, I just couldn't be there anymore. And I needed to be in a place that was conducive, you know, to, to what was going on with my health. And that's how we got back stateside. So I know listeners might be wondering, well, if she loved it so much, you know, why isn't she there? But I, I had major, major health problems to the point that I didn't know if I would still be alive today. So coming back to the state side and, you know, using the insurance that I had based off of recommendations from even the doctors there, you know, were, were, were really spot on. So the idea was to get my health back on track and to be able to have a thriving health where I, I, I was more assured that I would have this quality, you know, quality of life, no matter what had happened. And that was in 2019. And now we're in 2024. And my health is very good. And I'm still here and I wake up every morning. So I think just that in and of itself is, is the reason that that had to happen. So even though Nicaragua is the country of my heart, my health needed to to have certain things happening so I can continue to be able to be here today. Mm, well, I'm glad you are. I'm glad you're feeling better. That's great. And I love what you said about the sort of the body just knowing something like the geographical location, something in your heart, something in your soul, just telling you. I think a lot of people search for that. I think a lot of people, a lot of travelers <laughs> are searching for that. They they sort of they go all over the world looking for that that feeling. So the fact that you found it is amazing. Did you have? And also, let, let me just add that the fact that I found it, I know it, and I still was able to make the choice to come back to an old place, which was, you know, where I'm from, and make a new life out of this new place. So even though I feel that Nicaragua is that country of my heart, I am still so thankful to be here in my own country because now what I've been able to do post all that traveling and I, I get that I know that people look for their spot and they travel you know and they backpack everywhere and I think just the fact that I was able to be ill recognize where I needed to be at that moment listen to that come back to this old spot that I never thought I would I didn't think I'd live again in Connecticut in my hometown and things like that from you know way back when but I did and being able to appreciate that value and being able to see this old spot with new eyes you know 17 something years later and just develop these completely new and wonderful relationships with my family so coming back was another type of travel transformation, if you might call it that, because at that point, I now come back to the States. I'm coming back to the town where I was born, actually sleeping in the same bed that I slept in when I was a child. And now being able to deal with certain triggers from when I was assaulted, which is most likely one of the reasons why I did travel so much, because I wasn't really ready to face those other things that you know were hurtful so then being able to face that heal from it and then through this publishing process i was able to build this incredible community of people i've known from the past in a way that is transformational so it was also this other journey inwards after that journey outwards, that was just as important for me. And I think I was able to gain certain new perspectives and learnings because of traveling and being able to adapt and live in other cultures. It's now readapting and living my own culture that was really foreign to me. And there are even moments where I don't feel all the time like this is my culture because I lived so long and I was so, so immersed in the life which was the country of my heart. But then here I have my parents, my sister, my brother, my uncle, people that knew me from when I was younger and now seeing me in this different way as I heal through something traumatic and then them joining that journey, that in and of itself has been some of the most amazing parts of this journey that I've had. Mm, wow, yeah, I talk to a lot of people who say, like I asked them, do they have culture shock when they move to a certain country? And most of them say no, but it's when I came back to my home country that I had the reverse culture shock because you you do get so immersed in a different culture, especially if you're there for years. 
and that you know it can be really hard but like you say travel transformation can happen when you're traveling but just as much it can make you reevaluate where you come from and see it in from different eyes from different perspective and i like you say that is just as important if not more important than all the stuff you learned when you were traveling or living in a different country and that i think that is really interesting as well how it's when we come back that we start to see all the changes especially like you say if you come back and you're with people who knew you when you were younger like pre-travel pre everything you've gone through then you know that's just a whole different experience than what you had before so that's really interesting and i i know you said you had you you met someone in nicaragua you had a business there you started a family there so what was it like going through such huge life transitions in a place that wasn't your home country and wasn't your native language i love speaking Spanish. It is the language that I would speak all the time if possible. Actually, in our house, even here in the United States, we only speak Spanish. I mean, if, obviously, if there's somebody from that only speaks English, we'll, we'll, we'll switch over to English. But when it's just my husband's son and I, we're only speaking Spanish. And, and I think one of the other, in addition to traveling and you know, just seeing things on the level of I'm, you know, I'm going to go visit a site, you know, just being involved in that day to day life. That's that's another layer. And then being able to settle down and go through what's it like to purchase a home and becoming a parent in another country, another language. I, I, one of the stories, if my son listens to this and he, he might not remember this since he was very young, but he was probably in about first grade. He comes home and from school and he says to me, who is the first president of, of Nicaragua? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I when I, he said that, I said, I know who the first president was of you know my country. But now I have this kid asking me, who's the first president of this his country, which is also my adopted country. And, I, you know, and, I, and I'm looking at it and I said, well, why don't we research it together? You know, that's the way I you know, I didn't I didn't want to say, oh, I don't know. And, you know, he, he, he looks at me and he goes, what, you don't know? I said, well, I think it would be good if you learned, which is true. I, I totally do this. So, you know, we, 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 we learned it together. And I think when he was going through primary school, I was learning a lot of these things with him to be able to support him in his studies. But it was also great learning for me. I can now say it was Fruto Chamorro was the first president of Nicaragua, you know, but I think he also learned from a very young age that his mother doesn't know everything, you know, because I grew up thinking, oh, my parents know it all. Like he knew that I didn't know it all because I didn't know all these, you know, things that everybody knows in Nicaragua. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I, you know, I think it was such a great experience for me to be able to raise a child, you know, who's born there, who's first language is Spanish, you know, and we, I went through the whole school system with him, you know, we went through the college process together, you know, it's somewhere else. So really my life as an adult happened somewhere else. And, you know, being able to have those experiences are something that I, I just would not change for anything. I ran a business. My husband's a graphic designer. He's an artist. He's an illustrator. And we started a silkscreen printing business. So it was going through all these steps of how to open a business, how to run a business. I ran a business for someone else later on, a condo complex in, 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 Granada, in the city of Granada. And those were all these experiences that I, I didn't have in my own country. So for me, it was just, okay, I'm learning how to do these things. I had an opportunity to get a postgraduate degree in another language that wasn't my own. My head at the end of the day was just really hurting because that was a lot. And, you know, so now years later, I was just telling my husband and my son a couple of weeks ago, I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, I got, I got a degree in your country. And now both of you are getting a degree in mine and we're both doing it in languages that aren't our, our own language, we, you know, and that in and of itself, not, I'm not, not to, I'm not putting myself up at anyone. I have to say that could speak another language, go to school and get a degree in that language. That's not easy. And, and I just, I give my, my son, I give him so much credit for what he's accomplishing also at, you know, similar age that I was, you know, when I moved abroad, you know, so it's just fascinating you know, such a perspective change. So I think, you know, he, I think as he's getting older, he might be able to understand his mother better of the things that maybe she went through because it wasn't easy for me. It wasn't always easy for me to make friends because I, I wasn't from there, but I, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't at the same time because of the length of time, you know, that I lived there. 
there's just so many different things. You know, my mother-in-law is, is wonderful. And I was able to learn to cook through, you know, all the things that she taught me. And, you know, we always had childcare. There's just, I think that's going off of your question, but there's just was so, such an amazing uh, network of people and a, a, such an amazing, you know, sense of community. And that those things actually were what supported me coming back to the United States of, wait, I miss that community. Let me build it here. Let me find out how do we build it here? Or I I think one of the things that you had mentioned that reverse culture shock for me coming back to the United States was definitely a reverse culture shock. And it was also something that was very difficult for me to, I think, balance out my life experience and how that translated into even employment in the United States because I have all this experience, but at the same time, it, it, it doesn't always go hand in hand with something here. You know, uh, let's see, an example might be, I wrote a human resource policy handbook in Nicaragua with the Ministry of Education, with the lawyer that was worked at, you know, that worked for us at the job that I, I, I ran, the, the business that I ran, but coming back to the United States, that's not how things are done here. You know, you're, I'm not, I wouldn't, me, just as a, a general manager of a condo complex in the United States, I wouldn't necessarily in this country write the human resource handbook. I wouldn't go to the Ministry of Labor, well, we wouldn't even call it that, and I wouldn't do that with a lawyer. That would be done by a human resource department, a human resource generalist, you know, or any of the, those other titles. And so those are things that I've done, but it doesn't translate into the same thing. It doesn't make me a human resource generalist in this country. So there were all there's so many different aspects of of living abroad for such a long time and all the experiences that go along with it. And then that coming back and then, you know, now reevaluating and trying to rebalance out, you know, what does this all mean? You know, so definitely it, it, it takes time. The going and the coming take time. You know, the going there was re- getting readjusted to different foods. So a mango has fiber in it and apple has fiber in it. I would have a mango in Nicaragua for the fiber. Here I would have an apple. But maybe my body didn't recognize in the beginning that that mango was the fiber that I wanted because I'm so used to eating that apple. Just a small example. You know, but then coming back here, you know, it was a whole different rebalancing out. Do you want to learn all about the five travel transformation principles, including how to conquer your fears through travel? Then you need to grab a copy of my travel transformation guide written by me, Jessica Grace Coleman, as part of my Flip the Script Academy. It's totally free. All I ask for in exchange is your email address so I can keep you updated on all things travel and transformation. Just head to traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash free guide to get your guide today. And now let's get back to the Travel Transformation Podcast. Yeah, I mean, this, like you say, there's so much stuff to like, even though you're from there, it's, and I guess a lot of things have changed as well in 17 years, I imagine. Um, oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> my, you yes. My, my, my friends in the beginning would laugh at me because I did not understand references to anything related to television, movies, series jokes nothing like i have a group of friends from high school and they were actually the key friends when i first came back to the united states to basically update me on like all this you know so social media i didn't really i didn't use facebook really i never had instagram i hardly used linkedin i, I had an account but that was probably the end of it so there's all those types of things that were very different you know restaurants and you know, how to order, I guess, you know, what appetizers used to be the word that people used. And when I moved back, my friends were all calling them, let's go get drinks and apps. I'm like, what's an app? I'm thinking of those things that you download somehow from your phone that I didn't really know what that was either, but you have to have an, what's the app store? I don't know. It's an appetizer, but we're going to have drinks and apps. Wait, and that's food. It was just, it was stuff that I didn't really get at the time. And then trying to help my son and husband adapt over these past couple of years has been a whole new um, aspect of life because I'm trying to figure it out too. At the in, in some respects, I know a lot of stuff, but you know it's all new for them. Just like I had to learn at one point, so it's this whole 360 in so many different ways. 
Wow, yeah, you don't really think about like, you know, popular culture and things and just being so out of the loop for so many years that you you can back and feel a bit like an alien because you have no idea what people are talking about. I never really thought about that. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, we didn't. We had very where we lived. It was a it was kind of like a low area. We never had a, a landline. We had cell phones. We didn't need a car because it was really easy to get around by taxis or bicycle or walking. So we didn't have a vehicle and we didn't have internet in our house and we didn't have television in our house. We had the box that we had a VCR attached to it or a DVD as years went on. And what we would do is we would go and we would buy a movie on the street side for a dollar And that's how my son got to watch television. Like that was television for him, you know, or if he would go to, you know, his grandmother's house across the road and, you know, she'd be watching the soap opera types of things or, you know, or the news or whatever, he would go to somebody's house, you know, so that's what, that's what we had there. I didn't, I didn't miss programs. You know, you would go out on the street and you would hear the music that was popular for the moment you know you would walk by and you would hear a bar you know music at a bar people karaokeing or something of the music that you know that was popular there you would hear the radio a lot or you would be in a taxi and you'd get the news from people talking in the taxis or people talking in the park and all you had to do is ask somebody what's going on and you'd know what's going on you know or you can hear it being shouted out on you know on the loudspeakers that went around town so we didn't get the newspaper you were, we had access to it so we could read it every day, but we weren't getting that daily someone bringing it to the house. You know, we would get the copy of the daily copy that was at the hotel or, you know, some guy in the park. Oh, you don't want your paper anymore here. So I would get the paper and I'd be able to read the paper. So we did, you know, it was a lot of that. But I, I just I knew what went on in the rest of the world, but we were pretty insulate, you know, insulated as well. It sounds like an extreme digital detox, which I think maybe I need <laughs> after so much, so much bombarding all the day long, internet, social media, everything. I think that sounds pretty good, actually. Now, I'd like to talk to you about your book, Hurt, Healing and Hope. So can you tell me about this? Like, what is it? Who is it for? And I know it, it was sort of part of your healing process. So did the actual act of writing help with that, like getting it all down on paper? Was that a cathartic experience for you? Yes, I, I was assaulted when I was in college, and I still somehow was able to get myself to go to study abroad and to to travel in the safest way that I was able to. <clears throat> I usually always made sure that, you know, if I was going somewhere, you know, in those early stages, or even going to Nicaragua. When I went to Nicaragua, for example, I had a job lined up. When I went to study in Spain, it was through a school. So there are certain variables that You know, it wasn't just I I couldn't go somewhere just to go somewhere and be a tourist. That was unsafe for me at the time. But it was going somewhere where there was that safety net where somebody knew I was going to be there. And I had these if I didn't go to class, they would realize that or if I didn't go to my job, they would realize that. So I think that was one of the you know, I was able to do study abroad in in that safe way, you know, safe way for me. So when I went to Nicaragua, I started to realize that there was still healing I needed to do. I suppressed most of it and I, you know, I didn't really want to do much more with that, but I knew someday, you know, to show, you know, to be better for my, you know, better parent for my son, I, I knew I would have to deal with it. So it was, I journaled throughout the whole time. I always loved to journal and it was part of my way and it, it still is. It's part of my way of making sense of the world, of reflecting, of being grateful, of writing my dreams, of making lists. I've always been really big into that. And my counselor at the crisis center and where I had went that soon, soon after the assault, she encouraged me to write. So I continued, I always wrote, I continued, you know, I continue to write today. And it wasn't until I came back to the United States, which was in 2019, that I started, like I said before, there was all these old places I was seeing with new eyes. Well, some of these old places were painful at places of where something happened to me. And that's when I realized that, you know, I need to heal for real this time. So that's when I took that journey of travel, but internal. And I, you know, of, of kind of really going inside me and seeing, you know, what, what needs to be healed? How can I heal this? Or, you know, just healing in general. And that's when I started to move along in that process of, becoming a state certified sexual assault crisis advocate. I joined a writer's group. I started working on that manuscript 
for the Hurt, Healing, and Hope Thriving Beyond Sexual Assault. And I thought at that point in time that I'm going to publish this because maybe it will help one individual. If I can help one person heal from trauma, or trauma of sexual assault or any trauma, you know, then I would have done my job as a human being. And the plan at that point was just that. And then I started to think, well, how am I going to find that one person? That person could be anywhere. I have to get as many people um, involved to be able to get the word out because that one person might be listening to this podcast today. And if I can support the healing and thriving of somebody, whoever that somebody is, because we might not know the impact of what we do or even you with the podcast that you have. And we have so in, so many impacts, you know, and I, I want to be able to be there for that person. So I decided I would publish because that was what was calling out to me to do this, to support others in their healing and thriving. And I've had so many people that have been there for me. So I published with that in mind. It's a book. It's a performance piece. It's a spoken word. It could be something that you read to yourself, speak out loud to yourself, um, perform with a licensing right in community theater or a college campus. And then there's a journal section for you to continue also and with your own healing. And I've published a companion journal since then and a blank journal since then as well. And I am working towards right now translating it into Spanish because in addition to have friends and family who are, you know, in those other countries I lived in that only speak Spanish. In addition, I know that sexual assault is a topic that does not know race, color, gender, anything. And, and it's something that needs to be out there for all to be able to maybe say, you know what, if Melissa was able to, to heal from something difficult, maybe I can too. Or maybe they read one sentence of what I wrote and say, maybe I can start healing. And, you know, we don't know that. And so I want it to be accessible, you know, in both of those languages, which are both of my languages as well. And to be able to support women now that I'm here back in the United States, one of the thoughts that I've had is to have it, you know, to translate it into Spanish and then be able to work with um, women who might be immigrants here saying, you know, you still have rights because it's, you know, there's intersection sexual assault with substance abuse, with domestic violence and with immigration. There's so many different intersections, you know, within those topics, you know, and trauma is trauma as well. So I'd like to be able to speak to, to groups of women as well who are immigrants who might also feel alone that something happened to them while they're living in a foreign country because that happens as well. And so th those, that's kind of one of the, the, the future plans in, in that respect. Mm, I, yeah, that's great. I mean, I love your mission, but uh, yeah, I love that you're, you know, could translate it into Spanish. You can help immigrants. That's like amazing. And I love you said something there about my job as a human being. And I really loved that phrase because I'm always talking about the legacy we leave and how if we can help the next generation in any way we can with our lessons learned and all that stuff, whether it's getting it down in a book or, you know, on social media in videos, vlogs, blogs, whatever whatever way we can, whatever medium we can, you know, get all our story out there, like our lessons, the things we've learned, the knowledge we've gained. Because if we die without having told anyone about that, then what's the point of us having gone through it all? So I love that our job as a human being, even if you just help one more person, and I'm sure you can, you know, you're going to help loads more people and even more when you translate it. So that's incredible. You're also the founder of Right Heal Thrive. So is that the sort of umbrella company that you do all your publishing under? Do you do other stuff? I know you also have an Etsy shop that I'm going to ask you about as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I started, so in the beginning, I, the, the book performance piece, they're interwoven monologues. So the idea was that for Right Heal Thrive, as I started thinking about the title of the book, which is Hurt, Healing and Hope, Thriving Beyond Sexual Assault, I, I, I started to think, oh, well, I went through hurt, I went through healing, I went through hope, and now I feel like I'm thriving. So I added that second part to that book title. And I, as I, got, as I was going through the, the motions of how am I going to publish this, I said, well, I want to have control over this. I'm, I, it really, publishing for me became synonymous with healing. And I was taking back control over something that I had no control over, which was the assault. And I started to think, well, how did I, you know, how did I do this? Well, I started writing, which was my journaling. And through writing, I was able to heal and thrive. Hence, Write, Heal, Thrive, LLC. And as part of that taking back control of the narrative that I lost when I was assaulted, 
I formed Right Heel Thrive as a publishing imprint to be able to publish titles like Hurt Healing and Hope or Right Heel Thrive, a transformative journaling experience, along with other, other journals as well. In addition to now, I'm collaborating um, with a few other authors on a book that are keys to joyful living, because I've realized, and even that is so symbolic to me, because I went through this hurt, healing, and hope. And how did I do that? Through right heal, I, through writing, I healed and thrived. And now I've realized just in this past month that I'm actually finding joy. And it was through finding joy that I didn't think I, I was able to find. Like if you asked me 20 years ago, if I thought I would be thriving well, or even healed, or even if I had hope, I probably would have said no to all of those things. Yeah, I, I guess I would have. I did. And, but now with the keys of joyful living, I'm collaborating with a few other different authors through Envision Greatness Press. And that in and of itself is amazing. It's a whole package that you can go through this hurt and then all those things happen in the middle. And then here is keys to joyful living. There are moments where I just go outside and I stare out into the blue sky and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just so beautiful that I've been able to get through this. And, and I know, and I know this more and more every day that it's possible to find joy after so many difficult things. And like I, I like I had said before, you know, coming back to the United States, I was very sick. I didn't know if I would be here. That wasn't the trauma of the assault. That was just, I was really sick. So those are all types of trauma, you know, that we have to go through, or those are experiences, hard things that we have to go through. And I think that we really inherently are here to be joyful. I'm not supposed to live my whole life in suffering. And, and so all of these things, I, I think over the years, I have such a circular way of connecting life. You know, I'm very inter, interconnected and everything for me happens for a reason. That's just how I think, you know. And so having gone through this whole publishing process and not even a year later, I have this experience to write about joy. That tells me something you know, that I've gotten to this point and, and I'm actually excited of what's going to happen next. I, I'm not planning it in that same way to keep me safe like I did 20 years post-assault. It's It's been an amazing journey. I don't know where it's going, but for the first time in my life, I'm okay with that. I mean, okay, yeah, I do need to have certain things. Like I need to know I'm going to be still living in this house and I got a bed to sleep in, things like that. But it's this new journey of literally travel transformation. I, I don't know where it's going to take me, but it's a new type of travel that can take me abroad, that can take me to another state. I, I would love for somebody to hire me, for example, to do performance support for them to produce at their school or community theater, those monologues. So like, I feel like I have that in my future, that I'm going to be going somewhere to be able to be with others who really want to bring this out into the world. And here I am sitting there, you know, supporting that new journey for them because it's, a, it, it's they're going to do it for a reason, you know, to bring about, I don't know, advocacy awareness or, or what have you, you know, and, and if I can be part of that, that takes me somewhere else. So I don't know where it's going, but I know it's going somewhere. I love I love how you how you think about the future. A lot of people, you know, either don't think about it or they they just worry about what's going to happen. But you know, you've got a sort of vision. I could totally see everything what you just said coming to fruition as well. I think that's a great idea for like schools and colleges to perform them. You can consult on it. That that's a really great path that you could go down. Could you also? I, I gotta, can I just tell you yeah. say one thing that I just connected it right now to, to something in Nicaragua. So I've realized as well that. Nicaraguans, you know, we didn't have a lot, you know, we, we struggled, you know, but I always said to my son that we economically might have been, you know, poor. I, you know, I said, yeah, maybe we're economically poor. We don't have, you know, a lot of money. I said, but however, in love, in culture, in life, we are so rich. And I think that type of thing I carry with me, and that's what I still carry with me today, I think, actually, and I haven't developed this over into my head, but I think just having it, you know, you just kind of struck this, you know, right now in the podcast. So I think I'm having a, re a revelation, but I think Nicaragua actually helped me readapt to my own country and to be able to ha partially have this mentality because I know that in Nicaragua, 
nothing is for certain. We might have had a day with a, no water. Internet might have went down. When I first moved there, there was electricity in one part of town. And then the week after, there'd be no electricity in that same part of town, but it would be in another part of town. So we lived really thankful for that day to day. And we focused on those community connections. So I think today, and you know, with the things I'm trying to do now are definitely, definitely influenced by my life abroad. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've not lived somewhere like that, but I've, you know, visited the slow travel places where, you know, there might not be water, there might not be electricity. You just have to deal with it. And it definitely changes your your perspective and your appreciation when you you get somewhere where it you know it's sort of just you don't even think about it you're like oh yeah of course it's going to be there so yeah it's totally opens your eyes to a different way of living i know you have an etsy shop supporting nicaraguan artists and artisans so can you tell me about this yes we have yep i got two actually different etsy shops my husband and i formed this brand called coralillo and we came to the united states and we wanted to do something similar to what we were doing in Nicaragua. While we were in Nicaragua, we had silk screen brand and we had different artists and allies that were, would sell their, we would sell their products in our store. <clears throat> when we came back to the United States, you know, after we got, you know, a little bit more balanced, we began doing the same thing. We started this Etsy shop. We actually go to pop-ups and holiday fairs and craft fairs, and we sell items made by the sim- same, some of the same and some new artisans that we've known for years that we have personal connections with. Some of them are family and friends. My mother-in-law makes bags. My brother-in-law makes wallets. And one of the original members of our shop in Nicaragua, he makes keychains. And so we sell his keychains. Another guy that was in our shop originally, Walter, makes these fabulous upcycled purses made out of bottle tabs and he sews them. It's just, it's a great design. We have Ana Paula that I've known her for years. And we sell their items here up in the United States, and then we send the money back to them to help them support their families. So that's one of the Etsy shops. And then the other Etsy shop is a store with items um, that support survivors of assault as well. So we have some some, some mixtures of item, you know, of those items in addition to other items made by other survivors as well. So we we always like to give back. And we always, and actually even for the book proceeds, a portion of my book proceeds go to the same crisis center that supported me many years ago. And for me, the Etsy shop for Coralillo, for the Nicaraguan artists and items, is just so important because it keeps Nicaragua in my heart and it keeps us supporting the people that we love. You know, and we get, you know, continue to relate. I mean, I would always obviously relate to my mother-in-law and my brother and and my brother-in-law, you know, but it just keeps us, you know, supporting them in in creative ways. Because one of the things that we do when, you know, when somebody lives abroad for a long time or they're from abroad and they've moved to a different country to work and send money back, we have that same mentality. So we want to support, you know, our goddaughter, our nieces and nephews, our mother-in-law, you know, our family and friends there. And so we, you know, but starting anew, starting from zero, we came back to the United States with two suitcases and a backpack each, and we didn't have anything. Just starting that, you know, we, we didn't have the means to send money back either. So we were also, you know, figuring out creative ways to do that. Well, how about we do this? We're bringing Nicaragua and this great artist and these great artists and products, you know, to people that might want to purchase them. And they're from people that we know that we want to support. So by us selling those products and sending them that money back, that's a way for them to be able to, one, be creating something that's now selling, and then they get all that money for it to support them. And it's not the financial burden burden in the same way on my husband and I to send that money back, but we are, you know, volunteering our time per se to go to these different events and, you know, to sell them. So we're doing it in that way. And it's created, I think, such a better partnership. Like my mother-in-law is so proud when I say, I need more bags, you need to make more of these, you know, or I'll write to my brother-in-law and I say, oh, I sold one of your wallets. You know, I'll, I'll write to Cesar and he goes, oh, my gosh, I really needed all that extra money. My my car to go to the fair is here. It stopped working and I needed to bring it to the mechanic, but I didn't know how to do that. I'm so glad you went to the fair. So we get that, you know, and, and these are people that we want to see succeed. And I think it also, you know, the model is for them to 
you know, increase their own confidence with themselves, you know, for themselves and that, oh, people liked my product. I, I've cried with people at these different fairs out, out of the Etsy shop. I've cried with them because, you know, I start saying, you know, this is who made this. This is who made this. If you go in our Etsy shop, you can see what they actually look like. Like that's how connected we are to these. Pro- it's more than a product, you know, but that's how we're connected to it. You know, it's it's our country. That's our life. That's what we have back there that, you know, we'd want to be there all the time. You know, if, if timing, you know, when timing is right for myself, you know, with my health, for example. So thank you for asking. Yes, it's just it's just such a, you know, that that's a shop that I just I can't I see myself not doing that. I, I like to support, you know, different people and we'll bring a different artisans in sometimes as well. You know, I'll make sure that I meet them ahead of time, you know, see what they're, you know, what they make and things like that as well. It's nice. Oh, that's amazing. It's such a great way to keep connected with that country when you're not physically there. And, and on the buyer's side as well, you know, I'd be far more likely to buy something when you can see the picture of the person who's made it and you're talking to someone who knows them and you can tell, you know, their story and things like that. So that's amazing. So we'll put the links to both Etsy shops in the show notes. I'm also going to put your other links, but for anyone listening who can't check out the show notes, where's the best place to find and follow you online? You can follow me on Melissa B. Lombardo author, which would be Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Melissa B. Lombardo.com, which would be my webpage. And then you'll also see the Etsy shops, which is Right Heel Thrive and Coralio Art and Gifts. All right. So we'll put all those links in the show notes as well. Okay, so I just have one last question. Is there anything else you want to mention or is there any last message you want to get across to our listeners before we go? I would say that if you have an opportunity to travel somewhere, it doesn't have to be far. It doesn't have to be out of budget. It could be taking a left out of your street versus taking a right and going down into a route that you don't know. I think that just traveling within your area trying a new restaurant or going to i don't know a a broadway show or going to a community theater or going to a book fair or science fair at one of the local schools that you might not even have children going there those are things to start getting you out of your comfort zone because the more that we know about whatever else is outside of our own maybe little world is going to transform us and we don't know where it's going to lead so I, I did have someone actually say that to me, you know, you've traveled a lot. I don't have money to do that. I said, but you can go down that new street. Did you go to that new development that they just did? You could see what it looks like. Oh, I never thought of that. I said, well, that's kind of like traveling. You know, you're going somewhere else. You know, so take those little opportunities. You might not be able to go to, I don't know, maybe Ghana, but maybe there's a Ghanaian restaurant near you. And maybe you can go in there and you can see how their culture is just through that restaurant and how they attend you and what kind of food they have and start to make those, you know, little connections in your mind, you know, and then you have this great experience. Oh, yeah, could not agree more with that. And I I really love the idea of sort of traveling through restaurants (laughs) restaurants <laughs> like I love food so if you can you know go to a restaurant of a kind of cuisine you've never had before especially if you know a lot of these places they have all the decorations and you know things from that country so you can kind of trick your brain into thinking you're there <laughs> for a little bit get a taste of it see if you actually want to go to that country and yeah you don't have to go far to experience all the amazing things that travel can offer so perfect thank you so much for coming on today I really enjoy talking to you Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Travel Transformation Podcast with me, Jessica Grace Coleman. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate it if you could please subscribe, rate and review and spread the word because it's my mission to help as many people as possible to flip the script on their lives and transform through travel. And remember, life is short, so let's make sure it's nothing short of amazing. Until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side.